evening, UK Crime Book Club. Oh, we're in for some fun tonight. Okay, cross your fingers and pray to the internet gods that things just... I'll just stop talking. Hello, welcome to the McIlvany shortlist for Bloody Scotland. Alan Parks, Stuart McBride, Robbie Morrison was with us, but fingers crossed he comes back. So, introduce yourself, and if you've got book covers, show them off. Alan, let's start with you. Uh, I'm Alan Parks, and I don't have a book cover, I'm afraid. I'm uh, no. sure ill-prepared. Um, that is not prepared at all. I'm sure, I was sure you would do better than that. No. Well, I, I think we both rather assumed that the person doing the interviewing would be prepared and uh, have the books there. <laughs> no, Kindle. The book cover. This is our job to be pretty. Yeah. The see. book cover looks like most other book covers. You've got a man standing in the shadows and a big title. Oh, is he in the middle distance facing yeah. away from the camera? Yeah. Oh, I love one of those. I have several of those myself. Yeah. They're always a winner. I have a sort of a garden y thing going on with a oh, cottage yeah. in the background. Also, there was a man, but he's gone off the thing. <laughs> another unfamiliar choice of cover. But if it works, it works for a reason. They are gorgeous covers. Right, I'm going to dive straight in with, you found out that you were long-listed, you find out you're short-listed, and you do what? So what was the first thing you did? Who did you tell first? Alan? Uh, I didn't tell anyone because he told me not to. So, um... Why do I ask that every year and that's always the answer I forget because it's been a year? Yeah, no, they, they, they said... Um, <laughs> once you were allowed to tell someone... Once you were allowed to tell. tell. I, said, yeah, I can't remember. I think I was having lunch with my cousin. I think I told him. He was extremely uninterested. Um, but that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very <sure>? uninterested. <laughs> my story is pretty much identical except it wasn't your cousin. <laughs> he gets around. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, pretty much exactly the same thing. Yeah. So last night, Caroline asked um, the authors that she had on, whose names escape me right at the moment, which is terrible. Um, Emma's going to kill me. Um, did you get some notes from the judges? So did you get a kind of a bit of feedback or some thoughts on why your book was chosen, Alan? I don't think I did, to be honest. Unless I missed it. Um, I wasn't aware that kind of thing even happened. No, I, I don't think I did. Was I supposed to? <laughs> Looks like we're not winning, mate. <laughs> <laughs> These questions are going as well as the technology so far. <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't think I got anything. <laughs> Maybe they did, but maybe I didn't read it, but I, I don't think so. Pretty certainly didn't. Yeah. Hmm. I'm sure Emma said she had a comment from one of the judges. Oh, well, she's going to win then. <laughs> oh, maybe. Good luck, Emma. <laughs> yeah, for spoiling the entire event for us now. <laughs> we've got some, um, we've got Alex Harley saying hello. Obviously, Alex interviewed you a while ago, Stuart. Oh, long time. How do you do now, Sandra? Completely lost sound now for you, Stuart. Oh, that. Are you covering your microphone? You've not got one on your no, shirt, I'm, have you? No, I'm not covering my microphone. Oh, this is this goes really so well. I've never had something go so well in my entire life. Yeah. We're back. <laughs> oh, you're back. No, oh, good, good, good. Oh, good. Thank goodness for that. Okay, it's so just, like let's go straight in. Parties, Tell though. everybody a little bit about your books. So, Alan, the April Dead. What can people expect if they pick it up? Uh, it's another book set in um, the 70s in Glasgow, another collection of misery and um, violence. Um, that is about uh, about a bomb that goes off in, in, the t in Glasgow. And being that it's the early 70s, there's a suspicion it's part of the troubles in Ireland, but it turns out to be something a bit stranger. And... Um, the, there's also a, 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 a the, there used to be a a large submarine base, um, well, a submarine repair facility that the Americans ran in the Holy Loch, and there were a lot of um, American sailors around Guruk, and also in the book, one of them has gone missing, and his father comes over from America to try and find him and enlists Harry to try and help him find what's happened. Sounds fantastic, obviously, but there you go. <laughs> Stuart, the coffee maker's garden. Kind of 
It's awful, isn't it? Just having to, uh, this is why we write cover copy on the back of the book. <laughs> we slave away to get this this tight little message of what the book's about. And then uh, we just, Read the back of the book, for God's sake! <laughs> it's the same um, If you liked the other one, you'd probably like this one. If you didn't, you probably won't. So. Yeah, that, that's pretty much the same for me as well. <laughs> See, we, we are we are very much of a mind here. Um, so, Stuart, tell us a little about the Coffee Makers Garden. Um, well, it's somewhere that you can be warm uh, beneath the storm, knowing you're happy and you're safe. Um, he'll let you in. Uh, he knows where you've been. Um, that's all the lyrics I can think of at the moment. <laughs> My little Beatles reference there. Um, yeah, it's uh, th th there's a, a gentleman who has been burying the bodies uh, in his back garden for pretty much 50 years, which would be fine, except that uh, his house is at the very cliff edge now because the town has been eroding. So coastal erosion has got to the point where bodies are being shown, but there is a huge storm raging. And so it, it's just not safe enough to go and dig up his garden. Uh, without getting the entire search team killed. And that's the kickoff point. Uh, and after that, there's some family friendly fun, some running about, a bit of a tour of Scotland. Um, there's chips and fish fingers at one point, and uh, a wee Scotty dog called Henry. Oh. I've got to admit, it's slightly different thinking of the, um, the things sticking out of the side of the cliff in your book, Stuart, than it was seeing one, um, a, a hotel when I was. I wasn't in the hotel, staying in Devon years ago, and it was all over the papers that the cliff just went and there was like mattresses down the side. Kind of prefer that <laughs> to what happened with yours. Yeah, well, I, I, after I'd, I'd written it, um, there was a cemetery in Italy that was right on the right in the cliff edge, and it was coffins falling into the into the water. Oh wow! And bodies and things. And uh, if I, if I had timed the launch of the book correctly that we could have wrote a bit of publicity on that i think that would have been very you know tasteful i don't think anybody would have complained about that <laughs> oh what have i let myself in for with you two <laughs> kind of should have known that in advance really shouldn't you i kind of sexy, did sexy but it's men quite with beards. different when we start talking to you um Somebody has asked the best research rabbit hole you've been down. Now, you both must have done an awful lot of research. I can't imagine that you knew all of the details of things in your books. They're very gritty. There's a lot of um, stomach churning stuff, which I like, you know, in a book, not in real life. So, um, but when you're researching, is there anything that you got stuck following it? along and you didn't know uh, you, you couldn't stop it was that fascinating you couldn't stop alan should we go to you first again um well most of my research is kind of just in glasgow about what pubs were open in 1973 so um my kind of research that's the large part of it and uh and, and a lot of wandering about town to see what's there but you get you know the metro library in glasgow has got it's a big reference library it's got these very big scale maps of um <clears throat> the city centre in the 70s that tell you what everything is and you know you can get a bit a bit uh, I mean nobody really cares but you're like well you know at number 17 there was a pub called the thing me I can put that in or number 19 there was a post office you know and it's very unlikely that anyone's actually going to remember that much but I quite like trying to get things in um that were there because you know occasionally as we all do I've made some mistakes and um people go into pubs that were knocked down five years earlier so you have to kind of be um try and, and be as diligent as you can and um between that and um yeah that's the main thing is, is trying to recreate the city really that it, accurately you know as, as to what was there and and what was and, and you know you can get a little bit too obsessed with what bus numbers are the correct one you know but largely it's just trying to make um it seem as real as you can i think it must be really difficult to go back in time that far well, it's kind of weird because you kind of half remember it, which is probably a bit of a hindrance. You know, if it was medieval times, you would just take everything as, as thingy. But, of course, I stupidly asked my elderly relatives, you know, and all that was just caused a huge fight about, you know, how much a pint cost in 1973. So it was me thinking I had a reference, bunch of reference, you know, that I could ask. But it just, you know, they just don't agree about anything. So it's kind of, um, 
it's kind of weird. So, you know, it's bits you remember slightly, bits they remember, you know, and bits you have to do proper research with papers for. But, but to be honest, I think as long as you get the general atmosphere and the general uh, plan of it right, it's kind of all right. You don't have to be microscopically accurate about each, you know, each um, architectural feature and all that sort of stuff, I don't think. Hell of a dull if you did, wouldn't it? I know, I say it does go, but I'm in the Mitchell Library, I used to go to the Mitchell Library and the Glasgow floor is full of uh, slightly elderly men with lots of carrier bags and notepads writing wee things down with tiny bits of paper and I suddenly realised I was becoming one of them, so I thought <laughs> I'd better <laughs> back off a bit sounds before, like me. <laughs> before I was lost, so um, yeah, there is a limit to it. So, so when you started, did, did you actually sit down and think, I know what's going to make my life really difficult, not setting the book in current day. <laughs> But go yeah. all the way back to when people will actually remember it and will pull me up on every single little thing that I don't get exactly right. Yeah, well, to be honest, I was just so relieved that nobody had a mobile phone, but that kind of, you know, made it made it all worthwhile. That the fact that, you know, they couldn't phone each other. Because if people could phone each other, my books would be about 30 pages long. So there's not really much point. So as long as they don't have mobile phones, I was quite happy to sit and look at bus stops in the 70s, you know. Actually, I did a bit of Aberdeen. That was really difficult trying to find out bits about Aberdeen, about um, pubs in Aberdeen. So, um, yeah, they were very secretive. It yeah. was. It was hard to find. The ladies in the uh, the big library were very helpful, but um, yeah. Anyway, that's kind of the research pubs. <laughs> Stuart, research? No, uh, no, I don't tend to go down rabbit holes. Um, the, the most most interesting thing I think I ever learned from a research session was um, that it's not actually illegal. Hannibalism is not illegal in the UK. My goodness. It is the okay. procurement of the comestible in question that gets you into trouble, and not the eating of it. So you can eat people, but it's just how you get hold of the people to eat that it becomes difficult. And I'm glad you two are in Scotland. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can eat people south of the border as well. They can. Not allowed you can, you can, but they, they just don't taste as nice because we have much better water quality up here um, in Scotland, and we, we're all um, sort of light, lightly preserved. Highland Spring, surely that. Yep, yeah, products of Scotland. I'm drinking Scottish water. There you go. You'll be tasty for cannibalism. Exactly. Moving back at, to the top of Manchester's finest as we speak. Um, somebody has asked, the last scene that you wrote without spoilers, and I'll only leave this till towards the end, but I love this question. So, the last scene that you wrote, but without telling us anything that will spoil it for the reader once they actually get to it. Today, do you mean, or what? Oh, uh, God, what was it? Uh, it's obviously still riveting, I can't even remember what it was. Um, I think it was... <laughs> Shit, I did it today as well. That's not a good sign, is it? Um, you switched off for the night. You weren't expecting a gobby northerner. I know. It was about a set of flats in Glasgow called the Charles Street Flats, which were actually the first ones, first high flats in Glasgow, in Royston. Um, and they've gone through a few changes. And it was about someone looking out the window of Charles Street Flats. That's why I couldn't remember. It was that exciting. So, <laughs> Stuart, what was the last scene that you wrote? But without giving us any spoilers. The last scene that I wrote was a short story, uh, which just involves two nice gentlemen having a chat in a government office. <laughs> Not about cannibalism. Okay, just glad you weren't keeping that going. Yep, not scared at all. Seeing what you two have written recently, not terrified at all. <laughs> most inventive oh this is a good question and i don't know who it's from most inventive way you've killed someone off in one of your novels this is a good question for you two there is a lot of that um mine are all extremely pedestrian i'm afraid it's mostly drunk people stabbing each other there's not a lot of sort of you know in a trapped room and gas comes in and a spider bites you that's it's mostly um people getting killed in drunken brawls so I'm not really but the good way you write the scenes is what makes it interesting as well. Well, hopefully, but I'm not very good at that sort of, you know, oh, he was poisoned by the, his pen, you know, was covered in strychnine, and then, you know, it's, it's mostly just kind of uh, fights that get out of control. I'm trying to think if anyone's been killed in a strange way, but I don't, I don't entirely think they have. Um, 
No, it's um, it's How about found in a strange way. How about found in a strange way? No. <laughs> <laughs> If, you, if you're interested in pedestrian murders, I'm your, I'm your man. Um, I'm trying to think that anything has been found. Found was found at the top of a building. Uh, but I'm not entirely sure how interesting that is. But uh, no, it's, to be honest, you know, if you if you speak to policemen or, or whatever, most people that kill someone didn't mean to do it and they were drunk mm. and they were both drunk probably and it's just something that's happened and they've hit them too hard or they've pushed them and they've hit the head or they stabbed them and accidentally hit a vein. You know, it's it's kind of... I mean, obviously they happen, but these very sort of controlled sort of Baroque murders are really pretty rare, and and it's not it's not the kind of area I write about, you know. It's it's a, it's a kind of different thing, but yeah. So no, I don't think anyone's died in any hugely strange way, but um, a lot of them have died. <laughs> like my 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 favourite and weirdest one that I ever did um, was probably in my very first book that I wrote, which is terrible. Very, very terrible, terrible book. Um, but it was my first one, and the the opening scene, uh, it's about two hitmen, uh, and they have found a, a local councillor. They've been hired by his wife because he's having an affair. They've broken into his love nest and discovered his cache of condoms in the bedside cabinet, which they then proceed to unroll, smear with super glue and Raljex, roll back up again, seal the packet, and it goes back in the thing. So, of course, he's having an exploratory time of fun in his car uh, with his mistress. And um, shall we see a, a certain sort of burning sensation begins, <laughs> followed by the discovery that super glue is really quite a strong adhesive. Um, and then, and then, while they are screaming in burny, burny, hot, fiery, groinal agony. Uh, they basically blew his head off with a sniper's rifle. So oh, that's the most so inventive, crying. I think. That's pretty good. <laughs> that would have hurt. Awesome. Will... I'm absolutely crying laughing. I'd forgotten about that. But you <laughs> haven't read it. <laughs> oh, my word. It has never been published, and it never will be published. Oh, it's God. a dreadful, dreadful oh. book. Uh, I've I've got... it. Oh, I'm laughing. I've got... More on the shelf. We might, I might touch the, um, I might get some books out at some point. I've just not got these two. Um, somebody has asked for someone who's never read any of your books before, which is the best one to start with? Uh, the first one, I think. <laughs> I mean, if you're wanting to read more than one, you know, I'd probably start at the beginning. <laughs> If you only want to read one, it doesn't much matter. But if you want to start at the beginning, the same people do appear, so it's kind of like a big long story. Not, not that you have to read them in order or anything, but you know, if, if you wanted to, that would probably be the best option. How many books in total have you got now? Four, so not too many. But um, yeah, it's the same kind of people appear and, and, and disappear, so the, the first one's probably the easiest. That sounds fair enough. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I would say you should try the very wholesome adventures of Skeleton Bob, which was a, a little illustrated uh, children's book that I did. So I, from I, children's I, books I, to um, I, I, I did I did artists. the drawings and everything, um, and it's about <laughs> Skeleton Bob, uh, whose uh, mummy is quite normal, uh, and his daddy is death, which is why he's his mummy has to knit him. Uh, a skin of pink wool with big flappy ears because he's got no inside bits because he's a skeleton hence the name skeleton bob okay very difficult to get hold of though yeah i think i've composed myself enough to move on <laughs> oh biggest scottish stereotype you dislike that's a good question that I, I wouldn't have thought of that and i don't know who asked it Ryder, if you have one um, I like them all, to be honest. I'm a big fan of Scottish stereotypes. I, I try and get as many of them in the book as possible. Um, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask, um, as I probably fulfil most of them. So um, I think you probably need someone else. I think the one the one that bugs me is that all Scots people are mean. Yeah, that's the only one that's a bit stupid. It's just not true, to be honest. No, it's not. You just yeah. have to go to any pub. In Scotland, and you will find that people are not in the least bit mean. No, that's that one's a load of nonsense. I don't think I've ever heard that Scots are mean. 
Oh god, that oh, yeah. video four comedies are just they, they just lean into that all the way through the fifties yeah. and the sixties and the seventies and the eighties. Yeah. So oh, other than that, all the all the drunken, you know, idiotic ones I quite like. Oh, and the fact that we like haggis. I do not like haggis at all. Yeah, yeah. well, I like haggis is nice. Best Jane yes. haggis is good, actually. I, I, I would, I would I hugely dispute the fact that it's our Scottish national dish, though, because it's really? not. Mince and what? tatties or a fish supper. One of those two things, Scotland's national dish. Certainly not haggis. Once a year, you know, if you have to, and only if you can drown it in neeps and uh, tatties to hide the <laughs> flavour of this disgusting yuck. I have to confess, I can eat mince and tatties with a gun to my head, but um, fish no. supper is fine. <laughs> you don't like mince? What's wrong with mince and tatties? I, I, do you know what? It's terrible. I don't even like looking at it. I don't really like the fact it's made out of wee lumps. I mean, it just not for me. So what about chilli? Chilli's okay because it's slightly more disguised and there's beans in it, but the, the thought of wee lumps of mince just... No. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we all have a horrific things you discover about people on these things. <laughs> yeah, that's not my favourite. But a fish fish supper would be nice. Or haggis. <laughs> we'll agree to disagree. Mm, I think I'd go for a fish supper. I'm not the most adventurous food person. Mm. Not even a bit of salmon. <laughs> See, this is so, something that I that I really don't understand, um, and, and where Scotland is clearly infinitely superior to uh, to England, is that we skin our fish before we batter and deep fry it. I can never understand this thing where with with a cod with cod in, in a mm-hmm. you know, in fish and chips, the skin is left on, and then the batter goes around it, and then the skin just sort of steams and is soggy and vile. Why would you eat that? Fair enough, if you're going to do it in a hot pan and the skin gets nice and crispy and tasty, well, up for that. I can't but... think that I've ever eaten any fish with a soggy skin. I don't know. I don't know where you've been, but it's not my local chippy. If you no, ever come to Manchester, I'll take you somewhere decent for some fish and chips. Don't you eat <laughs> cod and we eat haddock, or have I got that wrong? In Scotland, you normally get haddock. Yeah. And in England, you normally get cod, I think, don't you? Well... If they can afford it, yeah, and if they can get it. Otherwise, it's white fish. Oh, someone has just put on the thing, cod has worms. <laughs> I suppose if you fish for them, they must do. <laughs> Sorry, that made me laugh. <laughs> one, one more thing off my um, picky food list, okay? No more cod. <laughs> no more cod, obviously. <laughs> Did you used oh. to get fish when you were wee? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Did you get the fish and chips when you were me? Yeah. Oh, see, we weren't allowed fish. Why? I, I was allowed to. The fish, fish was expensive and for, for grown ups. Really? In the, in, the, in the chippy. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was a, a mock chop. What's a mock a, chop? It's a pretend chop. Ah. It's kind of in the name there. Yeah, well, I, I didn't could have thought that. No, we used to get fish and chips. Mostly chips, but you got fish and chips sometimes. Like your dad oh. would get fish supper and you'd get some of it and you got chips. <sighs> Ooh, see? Generous. Oh, see, that's well, I suppose privileged, privileged upbringing, that is. Yes. I genuinely don't know if I ate fish as a child. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm probably pickier then than I am now. Not a clue. We can um, you know that's what's weird. Lovely Patsy has said, um, so Patricia Forsyth, Patsy said, like Stuart, just his singing is dubious. Oh, so before that, somebody had asked, if Aberdeen was a person, what would it look like? And perhaps they said, like Stuart, just his singing is dubious. My singing isn't dubious at all. Yeah, I, yeah. I used to get Patsy, paid. You're going to get me into trouble. I'm already in trouble. <laughs> I had a rather lovely voice. I played the plant in Little Shop of Horrors once. <laughs> it's true. Um, I turned okay. down the role of Tevi in, um, in Fiddler on the Roof. I can't sing either. I'm really, yeah, really not going well. Um, Patsy says, Glasgow changed so much since 1973. I remember Govan, when Margot MacDonald was canvassing. I walked Govan to city centre. Must have been stupid. I was 17. And she said that was for Alan. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, yeah, it certainly was different. So it was basically filthy. 
um, the, the, the buildings were black because he hadn't started, you know, sandblasting them around. Now they're also nice, uh, sort of auburny colour, but then they were literally black. And most of this, most of was huge um, brown sites all around the city. You know, it was it was really a bit of a mess. Some still from the war, bizarrely. Mm. But um, in '73, yeah, it was a pretty different kind of place. It was before any sort of gentrification, and they, they basically moved <clears throat> most of the people that lived in the city out to the, the new towns and started knocking down the, the tenements. So a big bits of the city were just in the plantation and the gobbles were just completely empty. You know, it was just like, I remember it, it was like these huge mud fields with big puddles in them and, you know, so it certainly would be a different a different place then. And Govan then would still be busy, you know, Govan had a huge shipbuilding thing at that, at, at, at that point in 1973 which now is almost completely gone, you know. So I think like every city, they, they change a lot in, in short times. You know, I'm sure Manchester or Aberdeen's the same, the, how they make money and, what, you know, what what industry rises and falls. You know, it's, it's all always changes pretty pretty rapidly, I think. It really, really went downhill, though, in 1971, didn't it? In Glasgow? Yeah. Why was that? That's when I left. Uh, well, I was going to say that's what it was, but um, yes, largely from 1971, it collapsed entirely. <laughs> Up to then, it was a sort of beautiful garden-like place, and then... Uh, and for fell. some reason, Aberdeen just started to flourish around <laughs> exactly the same time. <laughs> Nobody knows why. <laughs> so yes, there you go. That's, that's the story of Glasgow's urban decay. <laughs> um, somebody wants to read your book, Stuart, the children's book. Three-year-old son would love it. That's good. That's good. It, it, it's described as a, a slightly twisted children's book for slightly twisted children. Uh, it was to to raise money for the Million for a Morgue campaign uh, to get Dundee University a new teaching mortuary. So it, it, it's all in a jolly good cause. And there's only a small amount of um, death and destruction involved. Okay, <laughs> moving on again. Um, are you, are you somebody... starting to regret seeing you do this now? No, I love it. I absolutely love it when I can be cheeky. <laughs> oh, come on, Alan. That's an excuse for us to just be worse. That's not possible. <laughs> um, somebody has asked, have you ever acted out a scene? Now, we had an author, lovely author, Anne Coates, who acted out a scene where she put a knife to her own throat while she was practising to see how it would work. She looks very, very sweet, very much like you two. And then writes the things beard. that you all write. So, <laughs> so have you ever, I'm not taking you on, have you ever acted out a scene just to check that you're getting the details right? Uh, I have not, I'm afraid, but the, 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 when you when your book goes, there's a thing called a copy editor <clears throat> who checks such things. And invariably, I have people moving about spaces without moving, you know, so one minute they're standing at the bar, one minute they're sitting in a seat, one minute they're walking to, you know, and she's like, where is this person? You know, that sort of spatial thing, uh, I'm not very good at, so, she, you know, whatever, whoever the person does it, which is a kind of horrible job, but you have to be really precise with these things. They always say, well, hang on, he was sitting at the table four seconds ago, and now he's, you know, buying a, you know, so I haven't actually acted it out, but probably that would be a good thing to try and keep track of where people are going, so it might be something I will do in the future. Feel free to send us a video of it for our YouTube channel. <laughs> I'll be wondering about it. <laughs> Why not, Stuart? Yeah, um, my wife has occasionally had to participate in murder. <laughs> and um, if, if, if we do that, how, how does this work? Does that, you know, kind of, you know where does the knife go and, and et cetera, et cetera? Not very often. My husband do that with me. Yeah, but this so isn't for kinky this business. Is this. So this is, where this does is, that knife go there? This, this is, is pure, book research, purely for research. This, this book research. None, of, none of your weird kinky stuff. None of your weird kinky stuff. This is just, you know, for, for the purposes of literature. Absolutely. I got drunk a few times to find out what that was like. <laughs> oh, see now this, you're the expert in it. There you go. <laughs> so I could put it in the book with the sort of. But crap. did you remember it well enough to write it? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not do you not do that though? I mean, I, I wrote a book once, um, and the character, he would have that old manny thing where it would be a pint and a shot, or a nip rather, um, hmm. and it would be it would be gross. It would have to be gross. A half and half. But 
not 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 in together just no no I said yeah that's, yeah people used to drink that all the time a half and a half I, I remember it being a quite quite an old an old manny thing um so I, I i that's that was my tipple for the entire book ah, right. I, I yeah no, it is an old manny thing I, but i do uh research i forgot about this I, I suddenly got a bit um method so um i was writing about the, the american navy and i saw it <laughs> i saw this thing in ebay what a US Navy sweatshirt, and I thought, well, if I buy that and put it on, I'm going to be imbued with the spirit of the US Navy. So I bought this this uh, sweatshirt online and put it on, and it didn't make any difference whatsoever. I just got too hot. But that was my sort of, you know, sort of method acting, method writing concept. Yeah, that's, really that, 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 that's part of the problem with the US Navy is that they're all far too hot. <laughs> exactly. They really know how they fit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bang on. Vietnam, that whole thing was just everybody just being far too hot and sweaty. Sweatshirts were too efficient. I have I even, no I, idea I, what you, you might You might notice my, my sort of um... lovely haircut that I have here. Um, it does look too fabulous. I, I, I cut my own hair because when I was researching my book, uh, The Missing and the Dead, I spent oh, a lot of time hanging around with police officers and was told that, to be honest, when you join the police force these days, the pay is not great. And a lot of these guys are struggling by the end of the month and they all cut their own hair. And that's one reason why a lot of police officers that you see out in the streets have exactly the same sort of very, very short sort of number one, number two haircut. It's because they're doing it at home on their own because they can't afford to go for proper haircuts when 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 you join at that kind of level. Yeah, so I didn't know that. so I'm, I'm, st I'm still doing it now. But I, I, I sort of I need another one. I don't think I can kick in somebody's door with this this, this elegant coiffure. <laughs> um, one of the questions, and I really don't know what the answer I'm going to get here is, which makes it even more exciting to ask. The gritty scenes and all the detail that you go into, all of the things that you write, does that take a toll on you? Is that something that you have to separate yourself from at the end of the day? Or is this just part of the course for both of you? Alan? Um... I mean, not in the in the grand sense of you know. You, you, I mean, sometimes I tell you, there was a. I, I think it was the second book. I um, in the books. Harry, the detective, grew up in Care in the seventies, which is you know not not a great not a great place to grow up. And I am. Um, I just needed the name of a a, care, a home, a children's home near Glasgow, um, so he could say to his pal Stevie, "Oh, remember when we were in X?" You know, and that was all it was. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll Google Children's Home near Glasgow. And all that came up was just every single one was just abuse allegations. And, you know, that sort of became part of the book because I thought, you know, if the guy had grown up in that situation, the chances are he would have at least seen or known or, or, or experienced that sort of thing. So that was a bit grim, to be honest, when you start reading these sort of things. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's kind of... You can sort of put it, I mean, sometimes you sort of think about it, but not, not. I mean, it's not, or sometimes when you speak to people, you know, that have a, that, that unfortunate things have happened to, you, you get stuck with it a bit, you know, so I don't know if it takes a toll, but it certainly can affect you a little bit sometimes. And also it's a very different experience writing it than it is reading it. You know, you might go through a scene in 15 minutes and we could have taken two, three days to get that scene exactly the way that we want it so that all the words are enforcing the reaction that we want to get from the reader and uh, and the language is in place and the description going well it's do, do, is this a better sentence is that a better sentence what, what if that word is this word instead and maybe that should be moved to there and what, what takes you through this scene in the most immersive way so it, it's not like getting it's not like getting smacked in the face with what's going on Oh. It's, it's just sort of just getting rubbed up and down on the side of your head, just continually till all your hair stands up. Fair enough. Like I said, not the answer I expected at all. <laughs> um, somebody's asked my favourite question, which is memorable moments as an author so far. Uh, I'm still waiting. <laughs> <sighs> I've got moments I'd like to forget as an author so far. Um, definitely, definitely. 
No, there's been, you know, there's, there's been some nice moments when people come and see the video book and they really liked it and all that sort of stuff. So that's always good. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And um, that's been kind of weird, actually, obviously, because of COVID, that hasn't happened for a couple of years. You don't really meet anyone. Mm. Just who's had a look at the book, so that's that's been a shame, you know, because it's always kind of nice when people tell you that. That kind of makes it sort of all uh, all the sort of blood, sweat, and swearing sort of feel worthwhile, isn't it? If somebody yeah. has actually really enjoyed it, yeah. Not so much when they come up and said, "Oh, I, I only got halfway through it." I just can't be doing with it. No, no. <clears throat> you know who I like? That Dan Brown. He really likes a good book. Could you not do something more like him? <laughs> if only I would say. <laughs> I'm not showing you my bookshelf if you're not Dan Brown fans. I like Oh, I, 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 I absolutely adore the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. I've never, I've, I haven't, I haven't read more than about four or five chapters of it. But um, sometimes when uh, I do, uh, occasionally do writing workshops. Uh, for another up with Moniac Moore with a, a friend of mine, Alan Guthrie. And when we get to the end of the week and we've gone over things like exposition and character specific point of view and character specific language and imagery and all these you know, all these things, we then do a, a, a live read through critique of the opening chapter to the Da Vinci Code. Um, and it's it's generally not a not a dry seat in the house. I nearly got laughed out of Paris for asking somebody where um, where in the Louvre I would find the Last Supper. Nope. Wrong country. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you both working on at the moment? I can't take either of you seriously. <laughs> uh, I think the phrase is another bloody book. Um, which has been going on, <clears throat> so I've been doing that. So I've been up in Royston, in the north of Glasgow, wandering about there, which has been quite interesting. And um, trying to get that done, really. It's kind of you know you you kind of they kind of want a book a year, really. So you kind of get eight months, and then you've got a couple of months off, and you have to start thinking about the next one. So um, I've just been doing that. Yeah, I'm much the same, except I don't get the couple of months off. <laughs> so I'm I'm currently waiting for the, the page proofs to come back for the next book. And so in while while I wait for that to turn up, I'm uh, planning the one after that. I can't help but ask after the um the story that we'd had, I must have heard you tell that story before because I was sure I'd read that. I must have watched an interview where you told that condom story before with the super glue. Um, I want to know what else. What else you've got? What else to entertain our members, Alan? Um, I'm still just slightly disturbed by cord as worms in it. I'm sort of stuck there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm unable to move on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, whoever shared that. Yeah, it's quite quite shocking. I quite like the craziest review you've had of one of your books oh, okay. from Mr. Facebook user. What's your best one? Well, it was actually a, a, a panel thing in France, and um, the man, who was slightly strange, to be honest, opened the thing and he said, Mr. Parch, your book is revolting. And I was like, well, that's obviously some sort of, you know, language problem, you know, and you know, I said, well, I hope you don't, you know, obviously it's just lost in translation. I hope you don't mean it's revolting. He went, no, it is revolting. <laughs> so um, that was a bit, I was a bit taken aback by that. But um, that's fair enough, you know, but it was just a bit of a surprise. And then proceeded to sort of stand in front of the audience and describe how terrible it was for 20 minutes. So that was a bit weird. That was lovely. What a nice man. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't I think he had some personal problems. I don't quite know what was going on. Yeah, mine, mine is French themed as well. Mm. Um, Amazon. Core UK were selling a copy of Le Mort de Cos, which is the French version of Cold Granite, my first novel. Yeah. And it has a one star, there's a quite a few one star reviews, um, all of which are along the lines of, I bought this book, it is in French, I do not speak French. <laughs> one star. You might as well we made a t-shirt that says, I have done something very, very stupid, and now I want the world to know. <laughs> just, just, 
Why? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just go, ooh, kind of cocked up here. I'll return it and get the proper one. Yeah. No. <laughs> Tell the world. Tell the world. <laughs> Look at me. Um, have either of you killed off somebody real in one of your books? Now, there's a lot of death in there, as we've, we've discussed. Has anyone annoyed you so much or irritated you or anything that you thought, do you know what? I've, I've got a fitting end for you. Eh, yeah, I haven't, I'm afraid. I, yes, but no. Okay. Um, I have killed off real people, but they were auction winners. So uh, they uh, won a charity auction to be victims in the book. Um, um, I would never put somebody that I don't like in the book. Um, because, you know, if, if, if you go in my books, it's because I like you. If I don't like you, I'm not going through all the effort of writing you. So... <laughs> No, I like that. I've never had that answer before. What? Well, no, I've had that. It should be used more often, I think, in events. <laughs> but in my direction, thank you. <laughs> Go in everybody's direction. I'm going to go champion. Much better for Alex Hawley, I must say. People always sometimes say, oh, you know, can you use my name in the book? And um, my cousin, the aforementioned cousin, <laughs> Uh, wanted to put his name in, and he and there was a Celtic player in the book. I was like, oh, make me the Celtic player, make me the Celtic player, make me the Celtic player. And, I was like, and then he got really annoyed when it was published because the Celtic player was rotten and he wasn't in the first team. <laughs> so um, he was not very really happy about that. So it's kind of hard to to, um, to to keep people happy, I think. Yeah, and of course there's the, the big worry about GDPR now as well. What's that? Of course. Well, you, you can ask for your name to be removed from things. Can you? And companies need to need to comply. Yeah, I didn't know that. Mm. Um, somebody's asked about the bloody Scotland prize ceremony. Will you be going to it? Uh, yep. Yeah. Short answer. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly, well, depending on what happens between now and then. Fair we enough. could all fall under a bus tomorrow. Yeah, I think I've got to do a panel thing before it, so. So you're definitely going to be there? I'll definitely be there. Smiling as I don't win. <laughs> have, have we the same, have we practiced the same smile? Yeah. You even both did oh. the same head tilt as you I know, that's what makes it more sort of sincere. It's, it's, <laughs> it's important, yeah. yeah it, it, that, that, that's what sells it. That's verisimilitude is just bottled <laughs> into that. Somebody's just asked a question. Aggie's asked, would you ever use full foreign names for the other character? Um, thank Cleaner, as I have read in other authors' books. So are you going to be a bit more... I think we're asking if you're going to be using stereotypes for different jobs, unless I'm misreading that. I don't really understand that, to be honest. I'm Would afraid you you've lost us, Abby. Uh, other kinds of things. We can come back to that. Maybe Aggie will clarify what they meant. All so right. what makes you, in different books, obviously we've talked about different time periods that you've used. So obviously you've had to do some research for that, Alan. Yep. Um, how, how did you come to the decision that that was how you were going to write the book? Was the idea first there and you went with it, or did something trigger that? Uh, it was, uh, it was I um, went on, um, I, I went to night classes on um, Glasgow's industrial past, which um, one one week you went to the lecture and the next week you went with the guy and wandered about. I thought, Ian, he's really, he writes a really good book about uh, Glasgow's. Anyway, so because it's the industrial past rather than the kind of touristy bit of Glasgow, you ended up in these slightly strange places that I hadn't been for years and years. And the, when I'd been there was um, the kind of the mid 70s when uh, you know my relations lived around there in the north of Glasgow. And um, it kind of sparked my interest again in, in that time because. You know, it's, it's something I always say, you know, when you're 10 or 11, uh, before you become a teenager and, and completely self-absorbed, you know, you, 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 you have your eyes and your ears open because you're on the periphery of kind of adult conversations. And, 
you know, as long as you're fairly quiet and sit there, they don't really notice that they're saying stuff they probably shouldn't. You know, so I used to sit there, you know, kind of listening in. And so that time and those people and, and where we where they were was always quite a vivid memory for me. So that was became the time I thought would be the best to write about. Stuart? <laughs> well, I've not written historical. No, but what um, what makes you choose present day? There's a lot less work than it is <laughs> doing historical. <laughs> Fairly obviously, <laughs> um, uh, that's what. No, no, I I even write quite a lot about a, a town that doesn't exist. So all all my research is is up here and in the extremely detailed map that I I keep um, of Oldcastle. So yeah, no. Um, I, I, there is a novella I'd like to write that's set during the First World War, but I'm looking at the amount of research that would be involved in that and thinking, mm. do I really <laughs> want to go down that particular foxhole? Possibly not. Fair enough. Um, Aggie has clarified, uh, met, there are many authors that stereotype foreigners, especially Eastern Europeans, as less competent or not as ed educated as other nationalities. So uh -huh. how do you avoid that? Um, sadly, I don't think I've had any Eastern European people. And it's kind of before um, they started coming to live in Glasgow, the 70s. Really. I mean, obviously there have been some, but mm. the, there wasn't a lot in the 70s. So I've never really had any in the book, I'm afraid. I have. Um, well, at least I... you didn't get it wrong, Alan. So it's fine. Ah, I will do soon, but there you go. <laughs> um, I, I wrote a, a whole book about um, Polish people coming across to Aberdeen uh, and prejudice against them. Um, and I think it's, it's it, I think it's, it, the rule is exactly the same as every single other character, is that they're, they have to be human beings. It doesn't matter where they're from, what sex mm -hmm. they are, what orientation they are, what color they are, what religion they are, they all have to be people. And as long as you treat all of your characters as people, then you should be fine. Absolutely, couldn't have put that any better. It's very fucking worthy of me, though. Oh, and I've said the first rude word. <laughs> Bumholes. No, Alan started it before, and I'm not going to repeat what he said. <gasps> oh, <laughs> it was under your that. hand. It was just that I happened to hear it. <laughs> we, 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 <laughs> might, we might have known there would be foul language coming from somebody promoting Paris. <laughs> I know they're a bit sponsored today. Maybe they're going to be a free holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're coming up to the last four minutes now of the interview. So do you want to give people um, a reminder of your um, of your books? So, Alan, let's start with The April Dad. Uh, I'm terrible. I can never remember what's in the blooming things as soon as I finish them. Um, it's... It's, yeah, no, it's great. You should buy it. It's really fantastic, actually. That's probably the best option. Um, it's all about Glasgow, and it's probably one of the best books I've ever written, I think. So you're probably best to, to go out and get it right now. I think well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I can top that. I think you should definitely <laughs> go out and get it. Because apparently it's one of the best books ever written. Um, I, I understand it's, uh, it's, it's, it would have been a shoe in for the booker. <laughs> obviously they, they, they thought that really it just pissed all over everybody else's entries and it would upset the other writers to be so thoroughly outclassed. <laughs> Stuart, the Coffee Maker's Garden, give us um, a, a little recap. Um, th there's there's a man who makes coffins and he has a garden. And things oh, happen it it. in said garden. Nothing nasty <laughs> happens. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> nobody nobody gets a finger cut off, certainly. That would never happen in one of my books. Um, no, 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 no. There's just no, no scenes of gratuitous violence or, <laughs> or you know, a, a fight in a cafe that involves somebody getting battered half to death. There's none of that kind of stuff happens in my books. It's all, it's all jolly. Someone does wear Wellington boots at one point. Ah. That's, yeah, that, that's about as, as gruesome as it gets. Is that Alfie in his little his little welly boots? Alfie? Oh, Alfie! More than one person. <laughs> Wellington boots are a theme of the book. Just, just, just blood is a theme in uh, in in Carrie. 
it, it was uh, a Welly very boots. sweet and scary scene all at once. So the welly boots stuck out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the welly boots that make it scary. As she says, thank you for the answer. And somebody suggested that you cheat and get someone else to do the First World War research <laughs> for you. But then I, um, you'd just have to check it all, wouldn't you? And there's just... I, I'm sort idea. of in negotiations for that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good idea. <laughs> But they haven't they haven't actually sort of bitten bitten the bullet and gone with it yet. Nah. They're yet to take the bait. And on that note, we'll wish you both the best of luck. Uh, no, sorry, Robbie, that you couldn't join us. We can't both win. I can wish you both the best of luck. Two men enter, one man leaves. <laughs> and then yeah, comes back I... again and asks, was that a pint you wanted or was it a nip? <laughs> Put it this way, we'll both be doing this. <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody who's asked a question or commented tonight. Yes, I know Patsy you. was really looking forward to this. So um, she's thanked you both for your time. No worries. And I, we've, got, um, we've had quite a lot of questions, but I think we managed to get through everybody else's and most of mine. So I think we've done pretty well in just under an hour. Yep, I'm off to research what called worms and cords now. That's just the long I'm off lasting to turn my effect. Of this which has got lots of mints in it. <laughs> no, oh, little well, fruity bits. Well, if you ask me in years to come, which interviews are the most memorable? <laughs> worms and super glue. I mean, <laughs> thank you both so much for joining me. Making me cry on camera is always fun. Okey doke. <laughs> you all have fun and stay safe see you later